This is a joint event organized by the Südosteuropa Gesellschaft and BPEC funded by the European Fund for the Balkans. BPEC stands for the Balkans in Europe Policy Advisory Group. Um, in this discussion today, we would like to reflect on the new ideas which have been coming and debated uh, about uh, changing, improving or complementing to the current enlargement process towards the Western Balkans, being very aware of the challenges it's faced. Two main challenges, and uh, I could list many more, uh, are that the process within the Western Balkans has not yielded the results people have been expecting both in the region and the European Union. And despite multiple efforts, including two weeks ago uh, at the last summit, uh, the enlargement process has not made significant progress. In addition to that, the enlargement has been supplemented by three new requests for membership um, and two new candidates which also require framework for thinking about enlargement. So these are the challenges which um, the European Union is confronted with. And today we're going to be discussing uh, ideas of going beyond the current uh, process. But before I present to you the panelists, let me first give a floor to brief words of introduction to Manuel Saracin, who is the German federal government special representative for the countries of the Western Balkans and also president of the Südosteuropa Gesellschaft. Manuel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Florian, so much. I'm sorry for being late a bit. Since there are some new Zoom techniques, suddenly my uh, mobile devices are not working that well anymore. To um, just say briefly hello and to give a short introduction, I want to first say that uh, I'm speaking as a president of the Südosteuropa Gesellschaft. So what I'm saying now is not on behalf of the German government. Um, just to make it in a short moment, you know, enlargement since 74 had such a significant process and such a successful history, yeah, actually in the European uh, history. We saw uh, the enlargement of the bridge um, and we saw then how the Southern European states became free of dictatorships by the European promise. We saw the transformation of Central and Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe also um, in a peaceful way, probably the most successful transition process of the 20th century uh, with the enlargement promise. And also I think that the enlargement promise in the Western Balkans was major key uh, in the 2000s to bring peace and the common perspective and to a certain extent also the better state of art today to the region. So some people question perhaps is enlargement still a geopolitical instrument? I strongly believe it is still the best and perhaps the only geopolitical instrument which we have and for sure which we have for the specific region we are talking about. Uh, me personally, I'm since 2004 uh, inside my party stressing for the European perspective for Ukraine. And on my page, it was always clear that I think Western Balkans and Ukraine are standing together because when enlargement is seen as a credible geopolitical instrument, and it's obvious that you need the European promise to convince um, states and societies to, trans to transform, every uh, state who is accepted as having a European perspective is beneficiary for the other ones as well. So every new push for enlargement is good for all candidates. And I think this is really important to tell to our friends in the Western Balkans, perhaps even more important than to tell to the member states. Mm, you're on the same page uh, like Ukraine and Moldova and Georgia. And uh, when they make positive reforms, it will bring also pressure to your governments, to your elites to do so. On the other hand, I was personally sitting a bit more than one year ago with Mr. Zelensky. And there's this famous uh, Sluha Narodu um, serial um, episode where Chancellor Merkel is calling the Ukrainian president to congr congratulate for EU membership. And then it uh, comes, out, uh, comes out that it's the wrong number. She wanted to call Montenegro, not Ukraine. So I said to President Zelensky, do you think that any time uh, Ukrainians will believe you might enlarge towards them if we cannot cope with Montenegro? So it's also the other way around. Ukraine also needs the success of the Western Balkan. Ukraine's enlargement will be also not able to hold if Western Balkan is not also proceeding on the, on the same track. Um, and this is now the situation we have. We have a lot of models coming up, some of them triggered by the stack of the enlargement process in Western Balkan, some also by the new situation with uh, Ukraine. 
and what is my general stance as the president of South East Europe Association, I think we need to become to the next phase where we're not having situation that these models are fought against each other, mm -hmm. that we spend time and efforts of people who are all wanting the good in uh, like trying to convince each other about which is the best model. We all should try to find a way in convincing the ones who are not convinced uh, to go for enlargement. And for me, it's clear full membership Full-fledged membership is the only way out. Respect and eye level is so important in the region. Nobody wants to become second-class member, even not in a second division club in football. Um, but of course, we're in a situation that ideas are welcome and uh, we should have an open debate on this. So to stop with this, perhaps one uh, first question to your panel, Florian, um, in history, if you look in history, it was always the big question of enlargement. How big is the power of the council? And how big is the power of the commission? Enlargement was totally stuck when the French were two times blocking the British accession. Historically wise, we can have a lot of debate, was it right or wrong then? But then the European Union decided to bring the commission in the, in the leading role, in the driver's seat for enlargement. I think that in the last years, we had a lot of momentums when the council was bringing good positions to more criticism, to more efforts for reforms to member states. But we have to see that today we have a quite stronger council position and we seem to be stuck. Does anybody of your experts see that there's a difference? How do they wage this question of commission and council? Also, uh, if perhaps some of the NGOs are not so convinced that uh, the commission is in the best shape in the moment. Yes, this is my question, Florian. Sorry for already taking some questions. And now back to you. Thank you for organizing. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Manuel. And I think, as you rightly said, this is exactly our idea: is to to have these different ideas in a dialogue to each other, and not to use them as a you know a point of conflict, but see how can we conceptualize and offer ideas from different directions, from governments, from think tanks. Uh, from researchers on how to make this process more effective and we'll take a due note of your question Manuel and get back to that. So um, before I introduce the speakers just a brief uh, note for our participants you are able to ask questions there is the Q&A option um, or Frage und Antworten option uh, in the Zoom where you can ask any questions you have um, and I will include them in uh, later rounds. Uh, I will, we will first have two rounds of discussion by our panelists and then I will bring the questions in as it fits in this in the scope of the discussion. So let me just introduce briefly our panelists. Uh, first of all, we have uh, Chloe Goupil, who is a uh, Europe advisor of the cabinet of President Macron, um, who's joining us. Uh, thanks for joining us, merci. Uh, we have uh, Milena Lazarevic from the Center for po European Policy in Belgrade, uh, who's joining us as well. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, to Adnan Cerimagic from the European Stability Initiative joining us as well. And then Florent Marciac from the Observatoire des Balkans, Fondation Jean Jaurès, um, who will be sort of commenting uh, and, and helping us to also provide some input in this discussion. So I would begin with Milena. Uh, Milena is, uh, is uh, one of the co-authors of a proposal which has created some attention across European capitals uh, and Brussels in recent months, uh, together with the CEPS, the Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels, on the idea of so-called staged accession. And so Milena, I would give a floor to you to kind of maybe outline some key points. And then uh, we'll have this first round more as a, as a uh, tour d'horizon about these different ideas and then and, and comments by Florent Marciac and the second round to see how they are compatible, how they work together or how they supplement each other. So Milena, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Florian. Um, as you mentioned, I will just outline some key points about the proposal because uh, certainly um, our proposal is quite elaborated and quite detailed and uh, it would merit a longer presentation and a longer discussion to uh, outline all of its uh, uh, key elements. Uh, but uh, uh, I will actually just focus on three key points concerning uh, our uh, stage succession uh, proposal. The first one is about uh, the fact that this is a proposal on how to uh, achieve the moment of accession or enlargement before the EU's internal reform. The second point that this is the, um, a proposal 
which uh, aims and to uh, basically quote you, Florian, as you said it in one of our uh, events where, where we participated together, to unlock political will on both sides, both on the, on the side uh, of the candidate countries, but also of the EU member states. And the third element, um, uh, that this is a proposal which ensures uh, achievement of full-fledged EU membership uh, by default. So I will just briefly elaborate these three uh, points. Uh, basically, uh, our proposal is very much rests uh, in, uh, in the idea uh, that uh, enlargement and internal EU treaty reform need to go hand in hand. And that uh, uh, while the house is being uh, reformed and refurbished internally, uh, we as guests uh, should uh, not have to wait um, uh, in front of the house uh, until it is refurbished internally, but we could actually join the EU or join, enter the house uh, and maybe support and help uh, the refurbishing um, uh, process uh, itself. The idea is basically uh, that uh, um, um, we can create or we should create and we have created one proposal which would allow the region to be absorbed by the European Union while it is still uh, being reformed. And this uh, actually point leads me exactly to uh, right to the second point uh, that I want to focus on. And it is about unlocking the political will on both sides. I will now first, in order to elaborate the, my first point, I will focus on the side of the EU. So how are we unlocking uh, the political will, especially by those member states that are the most um, concerned about the internal functioning of the EU before it is fully institutionally and treaty-wise ready uh, to absorb new members. Uh, we have actually uh, built into our uh, stage succession proposal um, a uh, sort of a safety period uh, in which uh, new member states, newly arriving member states, would not have uh, veto powers uh, in the Council of the EU. Uh, that would be a temporary, um, uh, uh, temporary provision based on the accession treaty of each uh, acceding country. Um, and in this period, for example, 10 or 15 years when a country joins the European Union, um, it would, uh, its representatives would participate in all EU institutions uh, and uh, participate in the consensus building, in the discussions, in all uh, decisions uh, on qualified majority voting, but they would not be able to impose a veto. So this would be just based on a temporary provision. In the same period, what we proposed is, uh, as a one, uh, one other uh, key, uh, let's say, temporary limitation is that the newly acceding countries would not get to propose a commissioner uh, in the College of Commissioners, because we know this is a, another contested issue within the EU and an issue which uh, is already was already subject to reforms which have been postponed. Um, but also in that same period, uh, the EU would sort of have also a safety period um, in terms of uh, new member states being um, uh, kind of subjected to uh, increase to to, uh, to post-accession monitoring of uh, their rule of law and democracy uh, performance within the EU, because we are aware that uh, our countries are, you know, new, uh, unstable, maybe unconsolidated democracies, even at the point of entry uh, into the European Union, and obviously before. Uh, internal EU's mechanisms uh, to keep its own member states in check on rule of law and democracy, mainly the Article 7 uh, treaty provisions, before they are made fully functional, uh, this same safety period, this, uh, this transitional period would allow the EU to monitor the state of uh, affairs in rule of law and democracy of these new EU member states and allow for easier reversibility of some or let's say sanctioning in a way in terms of uh, freezing of funding or uh, reduced institutional participation, for example, uh, additionally uh, reduced uh, voting rights uh, in the Council in case of grave breaches uh, and uh, backsliding in rule of law and democracy. And basically this, as I call it now, you know, safety period or this transitional period, which would be stipulated by the accession treaty, would allow the EU in this same period to finalize its internal reforms. And this is where I go back to my first point. This period would allow actually the EU to both, to let's say have in, in parallel uh, enlargement. So the moment of accession would be able to happen, but the EU would continue its internal reforms. And of course the Western Balkan countries though, uh, would be also able to participate in uh, those reforms um, uh, of the EU uh, as new member states. Um, this is the part of unlocking the political will in the, uh, in the EU member states that are concerned with EU's functioning um, in an enlarged uh, union. On the other hand, our proposal also kind of creates several 
packages or bundles of, re of rewards uh, which should unlock political will in the uh, acceding countries, in the candidate countries. Uh, now, of course, the stages which we have developed, uh, you know, uh, they can be uh, discussed at length, but the key point is that what we propose is that as countries proceed to certain levels of uh, overall compliance and preparedness for EU, uh, for EU membership, they get some benefits, um, uh, some increased benefits uh, already in the pre-accession period. In the first stage, we propose uh, access to 50% of uh, what they would normally get as conventional member states through European structural funds. Obviously, you know, there are a lot of details to work out there. The countries cannot immediately accede to structural funds. There would have to be a period of overlap between increased EPA, uh, instrument for pre-accession assistance, and the uh, gradual introduction of structural funds, but the point would be to increase uh, substantially uh, the, uh, the financial assistance to the region in order to help close the socioeconomic development gap. Uh, and uh, in the, already in that first stage, we would propose uh, some uh, increased institutional participation in terms of getting selective observer status in EU institutions. Again, as countries further increase their compliance and preparedness for EU membership to another level, to, 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 to a higher level, uh, they would get, inc again, increase of, um, of both funding and institutional participation, increased percentage of uh, funding, but at the same time also um, across the board uh, participation as observers in uh, council formations, committees, etc. There is a lot more details. I will not go into, into more of those details. Um, in any case, reversibility is something that is inbuilt in the process. Functional reversibility in the sense that it would work through qualified majority voting. My third point is, uh, which I really want to stress, is that this is a proposal which ensures achievement of full-fledged membership at the end of the process. The, the fact that the countries uh, would sign um, and that they would get rat ratification of accession treaties in order to get into stage three ensures that these, that, that these countries become member states of the European Union. Accession treaties by themselves as legal instruments, they cannot create um, permanent derogations of EU treaty framework. They can only create temporary provisions. And what we are proposing in this safety period for the EU are temporary provisions which would be time bound already in the process of negotiations uh, and basically in the same to by the same token that uh, Poland, Czech Republic and almost other Central Eastern European countries had certain temporary derogations of their of the right of their workers to seek employment uh, in, the, uh, in, in the labor markets of some EU member states for seven years. This would basically be the same logic just applied to voting rights uh, in the council and uh, proposals, uh, pr uh, proposition of um, commissioners in the College of Commissioners. At the end of this period of 10 years or 15 years, depending on what would be the final adopted model, these countries become full-fledged member states with all rights and benefits. This, of course, would also create a put a little bit of pressure on the European Union to ensure that it uses this sort of a, well, from that perspective, you can then call it a grace period, not a safety period, but from our perspective, we would actually be giving the European Union a grace period or, of 10 to 15 years to finalize its internal treaty reform and ensure that when these uh, temporary provisions uh, elapse, that the EU is fully functional. Otherwise, it would end up with, I don't know, three, four, five, six more member states uh, that would have all the same rights and would be able to be troublemakers as much as any other EU member state is in the, in the current treaty framework. Thank you. Thank you very much, Milena, for this first outline of, of Sage Accession. And I would hand over to Adi, who is uh, speaking here um, and who will talk about the European Stability Initiative's idea of including um, the countries of the Western Balkans into the common market, uh, into the freedom for freedoms of the European Union without membership. And I will hear a little bit more about that particular uh, suggestion and proposal. Adi, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for your invitation and opportunity to discuss uh, our proposal, but also other proposals here. Let me start with something that sh should be obvious. There is one methodology of accession uh, that has worked and that can work and that uh, might work. Uh, and that has been deployed or has been used for years, for decades uh, now, and that has been developed on the basis of lessons learned throughout uh, different enlargement uh, cycles that the EU has uh, went through. And it is the most comprehensive, the most detailed, 
and the most developed uh, process that we have at the, 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 uh, the moment. There is no group of, uh, of us, of experts here, that, that can come up with an alternative process to that, that you know, might, be, might be better. But that process that has worked for decades and that could work again was uh, based on uh, was based on three on, on four uh, on four basic basic things. Three things were always depending on the, those that apply uh, for EU membership. They were expected uh, applicants were expected to adopt a key to meet political criteria, also including rule of law, democracy, and and other issues. And third, to have a functional market economy. And the fourth aspect of that methodology that has worked was on the EU side. And it involved willingness and ability of the EU to enlarge uh, and to accept uh, new members. And these four things that are the, the essence of the methodology that has worked for decades uh, have been there, spelled out uh, since 1993, and the so-called Copenhagen uh, criteria. Our proposal that you've mentioned on four freedoms and the single market comes at the moment uh, where uh, we think that candidates in the Western Balkans are not ready for full membership. So the three things that they need to meet as applicants are not yet met and they're not ready for the EU membership. But at the same time, we believe that with the devotion, with the focus, with the hard work and with a full support or a feedback from EU member states and from the Commission, they could achieve that. They could achieve it in the same way that the Central and Eastern European countries from Estonia, Czech Republic to Malta have. Uh, at the same time, however, there is a catch with that, and that is this fourth aspect, and that is that uh, in key EU member states for some years, I would say even from uh, the time when the Croatia became a full member, there is a doubt in key EU capitals that they can uh, accept new members, that they can see new member states uh, joining, uh, joining the EU without, uh, without uh, endangering the functioning of, of the EU. So in that sense, uh, what uh, in that, and, and the situation that we have now that has been uh, you know, made uh, visible through different statements, not just by President Macron in France, but also here in Berlin. We have increasingly uh, voices from the Chancellor, from the government, saying that without reforms inside the EU, EU will not be able to, to, to enlarge. So what our proposal uh, is about is that in this uh, situation where the credibility on the side of the EU is uh, is uh, not there. And on the other side, we have uh, candidate countries which are not ready for full uh, EU membership. We need an interim goal that would be offered to all Western Balkan countries as a step that would be so significant, so uh, important, and on the way towards full EU membership that would uh, allow, on one hand, uh, motivation in those countries in the Western Balkans that want to reform and that want to achieve that interim goal. And on the other hand, uh, unlock uh, the feedback from EU member states, but also a support from the Commission and from EU member states to achieve that uh, interim goal. And our interim goal, single market membership and uh, four freedoms, is about removing barriers. It's about making the borders between the EU and the Western Balkans, but also within the Western Balkans, uh, less visible. And that's what the EU has been doing for decades within its uh, accession negotiation process with its own uh, methodology. It was about uh, breaking down barriers, it was about making the borders between the countries uh, more invisible, it was about developing different interests, developing uh, different connections, and with that, uh, allowing for peace, but also enabling prosperity in, in the EU. So uh, our proposal is something that has worked before. We had uh, countries like Finland, Austria, uh, and Sweden joining the EU exactly in those two steps. They first became parts of the, of the EU single market, and then as a second step became full uh, EU member step. Our proposal is also in line with what uh, we have seen 
uh, being proposed by uh, or being demanded by those who have been engaged in the process so far uh, in the EU. If we think about the transport community, if we think about energy community, where the EU has already uh, been for, for decades uh, trying to offer parts of uh, internal market or common market to the countries of the Western Balkans uh, and the lessons learned from those experiences is that, you know, without offering all four freedoms, without offering a process of full uh, integration with the single market, benefits of that partial integration uh, are not as beneficial as they should be and they're not as uh, motivating as they uh, should be. Uh, different economic analysts that are un 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 unlinked to ESI have described uh, in, in details what it means for a country to become uh, part of the single market, to be able to enjoy uh, in uh, four freedoms and the experience of Austria, Finland, of Iceland, including, and their, uh, and their experience shows that uh, once you work towards this goal, uh, first of all, you can achieve it. And the second of all, uh, once you're in there, your potential uh, to use the economic uh, benefits to, 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 to be able to do that uh, increases. And of course, being part of the single market without having rule of law, without having monitoring institutions, without having everything that you need to have to defend the single market, uh, is in that uh, sense in uh, is, is in that sense impossible. So, our proposal of offering uh, Western Balkans uh, a, a, a opportunity to uh, work towards an interim goal of joining the single market and enjoying the uh, the four or the four freedoms is there uh, is is an is a, as such is an interim goal. It doesn't change the accession process that has been built, that has been worked on uh, for four decades, and it keeps the goal of full, full membership uh, there. Uh, our uh, impression or our assessment is that uh, those countries that do want to reform, those countries that work on implementing what, what is expected uh, could reach that goal within four or five uh, four or five years, and then those countries like uh, at the moment North Macedonia or Montenegro or even Kosovo, if we think about it, uh, would then uh, work as a motivating factor for those countries where you have uh, both the governments and the ten and 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 authorities which are not reforming, which are not which are not working towards uh, towards the reforms that is that is necessary. So I think at at the moment where. Uh, EU is blocked by the fact that it can't promise none of the, it can't promise Western Balkan countries a date for full membership. It can't promise, because of internal reasons, a support and the feedback that countries that want to join the EU uh, need. Uh, I think that uh, offering an interim goal that is on the path towards the EU that has been tried before, that has worked before, and that doesn't disrupt the methodology that has been developed over a decades is, a, from our point of view, a, a path that the EU should consider seriously and should, uh, should walk. Good. Thank you very much, Adi, for outlining so succinctly the proposals of ESI. Um, and I already see we have the first questions. Please come to keep the questions coming in the Q&A function. We will uh, include them in the later rounds of the discussion. But of course, I'm glad if they're already on the agenda and I can think about them. But now I'd give a chance to, um, to give the floor to uh, Chloe Goupil, who is, uh, as I mentioned, your advisor of the French president. And um, in particular, I think we're interested in hearing maybe a little bit more about the idea of uh, the European political community, an idea launched not long ago by the French president and how and what that would mean for the Western Balkans in particular, or how this would fit into the larger questions of enlargement. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Florian, and thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm very glad to take part to this discussion and to be able to say a few words about this concept of European political community, which, uh, if you don't mind, I'll refer to as EPC, which the President Emmanuel Macron proposed on May 9th. Um, just to start with, and maybe to state the obvious, um, we are in a context which is evolving extremely rapidly. It was mentioned at the beginning, uh, just a few days ago, we granted the candidate status to both Ukraine and Moldova. We also granted the perspective uh, to Georgia. 
We've been, as the French presidency of the council, very active also in the discussions, both with uh, North Macedonia and Bulgaria, as you might know, uh, in order to try and move forward as soon as possible uh, on accession talks, both for Albania and North Macedonia. Um, so I think this broader context and, and the geopolitical context also needs to be taken into account uh, when discussing this uh, idea of EBC, because it was very much linked to what happened during the last semester as France took on the, the presidency of the Council of the EU. Um, so maybe to start with uh, on the EPC, um, what I'd like to uh, stress are the, um, maybe the background from which the EPC came to birth. And those are mainly three lessons learned, both from the shortcomings of enlargement and of this promise which uh, everyone has mentioned, but also the frustrations linked to it and, and the frustration which was uh, felt both in the Western Balkans and by Canada countries, but also in the European Union, but also lesson learned uh, during the current situation and the situation created by the war of aggression of Russia against Ukraine. So firstly, uh, what we first, our first observation, I would say, was uh, the length and um, frustration links to the accession process. You've heard the president mention it. Uh, it can take years, sometimes decades, to fulfill the criteria. And at the same time, we had the feeling that the way we structure our relationship to our neighborhood is sometimes only seen through uh, the policy of enlargement, whereas we feel that there are a lot of other issues which are not necessarily covered by chapter openings, which need to be discussed right now with uh, neighboring countries, uh, be there in the Western Balkan or um, in other places on the European continent, because I should have mentioned it at the start, the EPC uh, is not just linked to enlargement and not just linked to the Western Balkans, but it's a broader political project. So the consequence of this first observation is that we need to offer more support and more integration and faster integration to the countries which feel that they are close both to the EU, but generally that share uh, in the same geographical space, the same democratic values. And I think here there are a lot of convergences, which what uh, Milena and, and Adi have said uh, before, in the fact that um, in this day, uh, the incentives are very far down the line. We need to bring some incentives forth to make sure that uh, this momentum, this political momentum stays, but also creates the right fora for early political consultation with all these actors and not wait that these countries become fully fledged member states to have these political discussions. The second observation uh, is that at the same time, having said this, uh, we do feel that the criteria we have set to open either negotiation um, to, for the accession or different chapters can't be uh, reduced or diminished. For us, you know, the Copenhagen criteria were uh, restated, but the respect of rule of law, human rights is essential, both to make sure that we belong to the same European community, but also uh, for the functioning of the EU itself, and that was mentioned uh, as well. Uh, and uh, I think that's really key because it's part of the European DNA and, and uh, it was, uh, as mentioned, restated uh, recently as well. Um, and third, this European political community also aims at bringing at the same table countries which are not candidates to the European Union. I'm um, thinking of EEA or EFTA countries and the president had the opportunity to discuss this last week with the British Prime Minister, for instance, because we also are deeply convinced that there are a series of geostrategic and uh, economic topics which need to be discussed at the level of the continent and for which the right fora doesn't exist right now. We have specialized international institutions, but we don't have this broad framework where we can discuss together all these issues. And this is all the more urgent that we have uh, historical and geopolitical needs arising now since the last few months. So the answer that President Macron tried to give to his uh, three main uh, observations is the proposal to create a very light and flexible new political 
forum, which would be the European political community, to cooperate between all European states sharing the same values and to contribute to the security, stability and prosperity of the continent. This uh, community would be open to all countries, regardless of their relationship to the EU, be they previous member states, uh, willing to become member states or not, and would aim at strengthening political, economic, cultural ties, both through decision making and political discussions, but also very concrete projects to bring these countries together. So without going into the details of potential members, obviously, all of the Western Balkan countries would belong to the EPC, so as would uh, uh, Ukraine or countries like uh, the United Kingdom or, or Switzerland, if they wish to join the EPC. Um, as such, and to come back maybe to the main topic of the discussion today, the EPC would be fully complementary and maybe even in addition to the accession and enlargement process. There's no aim to supplement or uh, to be a substitute for the enlargement process. Rather, we see it as an incentive to move forward and maybe possibility to create stages before full-fledged accession to bring us closer together with discussion on an equal footing and an on par basis and uh, and really a place where we could discuss climate change, the pandemic, obviously the geopolitical context, energy, raw material provision, all these strategic issues which we feel we haven't we don't have the opportunity to discuss regularly at leaders level uh, in this um, political uh, in this political scope and and geographic scope. Um, just a precision to say that this EBC wouldn't replace existing institutions, which is a question we had a few times, such as the Council of Europe, or obviously NATO, or the OSCE, but would really be aimed at being a, a quite light structure to be able to discuss these issues at, um, at uh, leaders level. We've had the opportunity during the European Council on uh, June 24th to discuss this idea with the 27 leaders. Uh, there was enthusiasm to move forward. And um, now that the French presidency has reached its end, we've also been working with the Czech presidency to try and have a first concrete meeting or incarnation of this uh, political community during the semester. So as I mentioned, um, I think there are strong ties with the two first proposals which were mentioned. We haven't gone into the details yet of you know, how single markets uh, could play with the European political community or how it could integrate to stage accession because as I mentioned, it's a, for now it's, uh, we've adopted a broader scope, but I think these contributions are extremely useful and as I said, uh, complementary and maybe just to and, uh, and restate that during the whole six months of the French European, the French presidency of the Council of the EU, our main driver has been unity of the Council, obviously in the face of the war of aggression, but also looking at further challenges that uh, the EU is facing. And the, the spirit of the European political community is the same of unity and cohesion. And, and that's really what's been behind the, the idea and driving the philosophy of this initiative. So I look forward to discussing it with you. Thank you very much, Chloe, for, for outlining um, the in broad strokes, of course, this evolving uh, plan. Uh, and I would like to hand over now to Florent uh, for a few kind of introductory reflections on those three plans before we go to a second round where we ask the participants to more specifically reflect on the compatibility or complementarity of these different ideas and how they could be put into practice. Florian. Thank you, Florian. Yeah, I, when I hear all these proposals, I do hear a lot, I do have a lot of uh, positive, I do see a lot of positive elements. Um, so there is the acknowledgement that what we have uh, is not working properly and that is euphemistic. So we need new ideas. There is the realization that these new ideas need to be comprehensive, they need to be ambitious, um, that these ideas actually are not so mutually exclusive. Um, so there is a lot of, of, of good thinking and positive energy, I would say, in, in, the, in the innovation. I could just stop here, uh, but since I've been asked to provide some, some, some critical thinking about this, these different ideas, um, I, I will just risk about that. Um, the first thing 
with the general picture and the trajectories um, which these ideas and these proposals seem to, to be setting for, for, for European, European projects, um, is some concern that we are trying to fix uh, an accession process in a very bold way and also how to structure the continent while not knowing very much what the EU wants to become. So that's the first thing. So we are trying to fix things which are a bit outside while having a lot of troubles in the inside. So it's a very old debate, widening versus deepening. And this relates to um, what Mr. Sarrazin was, 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 um, was uh, mentioning, a shift in the dynamics of the EU for, so towards more intergovernmentalism uh, since the Treaty of Lisbon and uh, uh, the erosion of community actors. So we, we, we kind of lose a little bit this sense of purpose because every single nation is, is, is pursuing different interests and different visions of the EU. So that's the first difficulty, but these, these proposals are just resisting a little bit um, at that and, and go forward by putting things on the table. Now, if I look more specifically on these proposals, uh, let's start with the EPC, the European Political Community. I, I have three concerns or three questions. The first one, um, I do understand that we would need a kind of non-specialized pan-European framework, uh, but what would be the accession criteria for this uh, framework? Uh, if democratic standards are required, uh, can Turkey be in? If Turkey is in, how do we convince, for instance, Norway to join? And what do we do, for instance, with uh, the objections of Kosovo's non-recognizers who would not see Kosovo as a state? So these are, these are a bit my, my simplest uh, concern. The second concern or, 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 or kind of questions I have uh, is what, what, what would be the common regional interest underpinning the EPC? When I think about the potential members of the EPC, I see a broad scope of interests. Uh, so Switzerland wants to, to, is interested in single market, but not at all in political integration. Ukraine wants security. The Western Balkans want to, 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 to join the EU. Um, and even within the EU, uh, the member states do not share the same vision uh, about what the EU should be about. Uh, so don't we risk by inviting 40 plus countries around the table, um, don't we risk to actually dilute the efforts at, at muscling a little bit the EU politically? Uh, but that's not even my biggest concern. My biggest concern or question is what would be the role of the EU within the EPC? Will the EEPC be an intergovernmental platform based on the sovereign equality principle that does not make a difference between EU member states and non-member states, and that discusses also topics which are divisive also for the EU itself, for instance, recognition of Kosovo, for instance, civilian use of nuclear energy, or will it be a platform with the EU as a, as a core seeking to structure politically a periphery. And this is a risk I see. Enrico Letta advocates um, that the EPC be placed under the guidance of the EU, that it should be chaired by the presidency of the EU. But then don't we run the risk of formalizing these core periphery relations, which we had before with Eastern Partnership to some extent, and the malfunctioning, dysfunctioning accession policy also. Don't we run the risk of transforming this, this European project into some kind of neo-imperial mode of governance? And we blame for that what Russia is already doing. So that's, that's a little bit the kind of questions I would have for the EPC. Now, for the others, um, uh, so for the, the, the proposal of, of, of SEP and AZ, which are extremely detailed, uh, so I would not, I, I would just uh, identify a couple of, of questions. Both proposals appeal to the logic of consequentialism, so they offer greater incentives, access to single markets, gradual access to cohesion funds, and they presume some kind of uh, consistent use of conditionality. I have never been a very fierce uh, proponent of, of historical materialism, but I really admit that market-based integration and, and social economic progress is a necessary condition for successful integration. But is it a sufficient one? Uh, the past couple of months have brought me to think, has this model of European integration, the one we've used, we, 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 which proved effective, largely inspired by Germany, has it not reached its limits in terms of what it can do for the future? Don't we need something bolder than market integration 
uh, to advance the political unification of the continents? That would be one, one question. Milena would object that the, the set proposal builds also on the, the logic of appropriateness, uh, that it opens the door um, of the EU to non-EU member states, it fosters socialization. But can't we find ways to boost pan-European socialization at the grassroots level rather than just at the elite level? Um, I'm not sure these proposals put the citizens in the middle of their strategy. And I'm afraid that once again, these proposals could be uh, diverted by autocratic leaders. If we come back to uh, conditionality, uh, in both proposals, um, AZ and SEP, it is a, a masterpiece in size. Um, they provide that the process should be based on merits and that progress should be assessed objectively with more quantifiable benchmarks. I understand the logic. Uh, it has very much Christian, Christian um, uh, roots. Access to the heaven uh, is limited to those who deserve it. With a, 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 a nice neo-positivist twist, uh, progress is quantifiable. But I think that this emphasis on quantifiable merits has a major downside. First, uh, it comforts the EU in its uh, very narcissistic idea that it is a, a club of deserving nations that the nations which are members are members because they are wealthier, more democratic, wiser. And that idea is not only wrong, historically, if you think about Timothy Snyder's fable of the wiser nation, it is also profoundly unfair because the costs of merits are not evenly distributed. If you think about Bosnia as a governor, some countries do not start as, from the same um, hardships um, as, as others. But that's not all. Uh, if you insist more on merits, what might happen can be actually counterproductive. It fuels uh, what Michael Sandel calls the hubris of the winner. Those who made it in the EU tend to abuse their prerogative by blocking others because they would argue that the others do not deserve it. We've got many examples of that. Uh, hence my question, by insisting on merits rather than solidarity, how do we pave the way for a politically more united Europe how do your proposals in SEP, in AZ, for instance, help solving bilateral issues? And my last point, both uh, proposals of AZ and SEP uh, suggest to improve conditionality by quantifying progress. Making the assessment more objective will make it fairer. It is intuitive, but social scientists know that it's not easy to quantify success. So who should quantify it? Experts. Well, this is a recipe for growing populism and social discourse. It's been already discussed 100 years ago uh, by Littmann and Dewey, and we see how it is that day. So uh, how uh, I mean, should the EU project and should EU accession really be about homework, grades, uh, graduations, stick and carrots like with donkeys, or is it all, all what remained from the flame of founding fathers? And yeah, I come back to this grass, grassroots socialization. So to conclude, I, these proposals are very much uh, problem solving oriented, uh, seeing the difficulties trying to overcome them. In the bigger pictures, they raise a series of questions about the vision of the EU, what kind of integration it would like. And I think it's necessary to engage also at this level. Great. Thank you very much, Florent. Um, so I would, uh, there are already quite a few questions, but I would give a quick round um, to all the panelists to reflect briefly on, on um, some of the points which Florent mentioned as you wish, as well as the question really is, uh, do you see these different proposals as complementary? Uh, can they coexist? Should they coexist? Uh, or are they, uh, are they a certain way um, incompatible? So Milena, why don't you go ahead? Uh, thank you, Flo uh, Florian. I think that uh, regarding uh, our time limit here, I really should be quite brief. Uh, to give uh, an elaborate and proper response to Flor Florent's uh, comments, I think it would necessitate uh, a much longer conversation. But I can just say that, you know, when we started to, 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 to design this staged accession model, and even before that, when I started my first papers on rethinking enlargement and uh, rethinking this binary all-in, all-out uh, approach to accession, we thought we were thinking outside of the box. And now Florent is thinking outside of the galaxy. <laughs> uh, 
And I, I absolutely, I have, uh, I mean, I, I cannot say anything negative about the idea of uh, uh, integration and solidarity at a societal level. I mean, that as a concept is absolutely positive, but we, we are in a political process. And uh, unless we can persuade the most skeptical EU member states that solidarity at the European continent should uh, somehow be the, the the main motivating or the main uh, driving uh, driving force uh, of uh, EU's enlargement. Uh, I'm not sure that with just this kind of an approach we can we can get, get get there. So I would absolutely be in favor of combining a much more citizen driven and societal approach uh, in combination with uh, with uh, uh, a technical process and political process in which I I'm afraid we are stuck. Uh, in, 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 in this current context. And perhaps the European political community can be one of those, uh, let's say, processes which can maybe try to be less elitist and actually try to also engage societies. So maybe there is a potential to uh, actually link your ideas and your questions, Florent, uh, more with, uh, with, with the French idea of European political community. I would also say that, um, and, I, and here I think that I, I will probably build on what you said, that with the, the outbreak of the war in Ukraine, I think that we have all realized just how important this political uh, uh, cooperation is, how important it is to cooperate and to, to work with, uh, well, I would say, uh, uh, like-minded states and countries uh, not only in uh, in terms of uh, integration and uh, and uh, enlargement, but also in terms of general economic cooperation. Um, so I'm at this point. I'm just not sure that breaking up the process. Uh, and here I'm coming uh, to 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 maybe discuss just briefly the relationship between our proposal and uh, ESI's proposal. Um, I think that before the outbreak of of, of the war in Ukraine, maybe single market could have been construed and thought as an interim uh, interim stage of, uh, of the full accession process, full integration process. At this point, I think we are moving into the opposite direction. We are moving into the front loading of political, uh, not only political criteria in the sense in which we, we think about them, uh, rule of law, democracy, but also the political pillars of the EU. I think that uh, um, uh, all the areas related to foreign policy um, uh, and, and, and uh, defense cooperation are going to become more and more front loaded in the process. I'm not sure that the EU will want to allow and I, I have to use my own country, unfortunately, as an example there, but I don't think that the EU will want to let a Russian spy into its internal uh, market, even if it satisfies all the criteria formally. So in a way, I think that we will actually demand, and I think it is fair at this point, we will demand much more front loading in the process of these uh, harder, let's say, uh, uh, political uh, elements of integration. And if, if we agree on that, and if this is the direction in which we are going, then why not have a process which just takes everything uh, forward uh, in parallel? Why then break it up? I know that uh, Mr. Pierre Mirel uh, is working on this idea to uh, create a staged process, staged process which would actually have the common market as one of the stages. So maybe this is possible, but I think that this uh, idea of full-fledged membership, arriving at full-fledged membership is absolutely necessary. And I don't think that even if we are to just say, okay, we will just uh, negotiate uh, entrance, entrance into the internal market now, and then we will leave the rest for the future. I don't think that this could be done without changing the accession process as it is. Accession negotiations have a very complex uh, bureaucratic administrative logic, which if we start to meddle with that, I mean, we, we need to find ways to make it easier and to make it more rewarding for the countries. But I think we have to keep the basic logic of the process that while we are negotiating, we are negotiating to sign accession treaties to the European Union. Having some other interim accession negotiations in the meantime, I'm afraid that at this point, it might actually complicate the process, but perhaps we can actually try to front load some of the, some of the aspects of internal market that can be achieved uh, uh, sooner rather than later. So there are probably some ways to combine it, but I would still argue that the necessity to, to, to uh, um, ensure access to increased, much, much, great, uh, much, much uh, more increased um, pre-accession assistance 
uh, and the institutional participation and socialization, I think that these are ex two extremely important elements in order to drive the reforms here in the region and to ensure that value uh, in value uh, terms, but also in terms of the process and socialization, as I said, that we don't drift apart from, uh, from the EU. I, I will have much more to say on, on, on this, and I think it really merits a much longer and much more in-depth discussion. I'm grateful to be a PAG and uh, uh, SOG for starting this discussion. I think that this is something that we really need to continue. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Milena. Uh, Adi, why don't you go next and uh, address some of the yes. questions? And Maybe I start with, with citizens because Florent mentioned them. Uh, one thing has to be clear. While everyone speaks about the return of war in Europe in Ukraine. The fact is that since 1990s, Europe has seen many, many wars. And they've happened in countries and in areas that were neither part of the EU nor part of the single market. So if we talk about citizens, peace as something of a basis for social development is extremely important. Having a, a process uh, that fortifies peace in the Western Balkans that at the moment uh, exists is something that's uh, beneficial. Second of all, when we talk about economic and social development, if we look around in Europe, everywhere outside of the single market and outside of the EU, you will not find a country that managed to develop and to keep that development and to bridge the gap with the, the central part of, 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 of the EU, of, of the European continent. Maybe UK now will uh, manage to do that outside of the, of the EU and outside of the single market, but elsewhere it's not possible. So if we are talking about uh, two basic things that citizens need, that is peace and hope to have some kind of economic prosperity and social development, then those, that's a minimum uh, step to, uh, to achieve that. When it comes to different uh, proposals, what I like about CEP and CEP's uh, proposal is uh, actually uh, the opposite of what Florent argues, and that is that it actually links progress in achieving uh, uh, in achieving reforms, in achieving alignment with the EU standards and with the EU a key to rewards on the path towards the EU. I think that proposal is, is very uh, clear on that. And I think if, if we would follow that logic where the assessment of the European Commission, which is similar to the, uh, to the negotiating uh, process, it's, some, it's the best thing we have at, at the moment. I think we wouldn't get into the situation where Serbia, for example, is a front runner together with Montenegro. But at the same time, if you look at the key four key uh, issues that the commission looks at in, in, uh, in chapters 23 and 24, it's doing worse than Albania, which hadn't even uh, open accession talks. So I think uh, conditionality and, uh, and assessment of progress in achieving EU standards is important. But when it comes to solidarity that Florent mentioned, I think solidarity, it comes in uh, providing feedback and providing support to the countries to achieve these EU standards, which at the moment we don't see neither in Montenegro, nor in Serbia, nor in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Kosovo. So if we speak about some kind of solidarity, I would advocate for a solidarity in feedback and providing a support for these countries within some kind of a process that works, that has a goal, uh, achieve that. In that sense, uh, what Milena mentioned about foreign uh, policy, I fully agree. If we look at Montenegro since 2007, a country that has closed the chapter, that has uh, that is aligned 100%, that is a NATO member, that is a very cooperative and very positive member of, of the NATO, at the moment has uh, no rewards or no goal at sight that it can achieve. There is no reason for anyone in the EU to say that Montenegro couldn't become a 28 EU member state in the next uh, several years and take the position of, of the UK. So there are different different aspects that, that could and that need to be addressed. I also think that in CEP, CEP's proposal, uh, when it comes to more funding, I think that's uh, important. Uh, I don't think that it's necessarily possible to link it to a progress on the basis of yearly or two years because the projects that EU does are difficult to implement on that kind of basis. You know, it's a longer term process. EU has a very good experience with it and 
uh, it's it's difficult to 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 link the the funding to progress on an annual basis or etc. But it's 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 definitely something that that needs to be uh, looked at. And I think Milan also touched about it, and we spoke about it lengthy uh, in the proposal uh, from Step Step. What I was missing is the single market, uh, common market uh, membership, because I think that's the pillar of the EU. That's the basis. You know, that's how you break down the barriers. That's how you make borders more invisible. That's how you unlock the economic potential that's how you then have impact on monitoring institutions on rule of law institutions that's how you can then uh, have uh, have an increased impact on 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 the countries that that uh, want to join so uh, in that proposal it hasn't been mentioned it's it's not clear at what at what step it, it, it would come and I think that's something that that would need to uh, that would need to be in my opinion addressed uh, also when it comes to the institutions and participation uh, I think that uh, if you look at the EAA countries like Norway uh, you will see you know they're participating in most of the agencies they're participating in a great number of programs they are part of the working groups in the commission they're part of the council working group they do not sit in the council they do not sit in the commission but ability to influence and to be informed about upcoming decisions about upcoming uh, uh, laws uh, that 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 the EU wants or standards that EU wants to introduce is is given by the uh, by the single single market uh, membership for countries that are that are uh, part of the single market. And when it comes to the EPC proposal, I will be brave and say it reminds me a bit of a Berlin process for but it's not for the Western Balkans. It's for the entire uh, European uh, continent. And in that sense, I think it's beneficial to have countries. Uh, come together to have to discuss different issues, also discuss particular uh, issues. But if we want to uh, make wars unthinkable in the Western Balkans, if we want to unlock economic and political uh, development, social development in these countries, it's about standards, it's about technical things that these countries need uh, to move uh, forward. And in that sense, uh, meetings, discussions, socialization, uh, with the political leaders cannot uh, or at least cannot damage in in most of the in most of the in most of the uh, cases as we have seen with the with the uh, berlin process but leaving out this crucial uh, issue of how do we get these countries to uh, achieve eu standards implement eu standards uh, is 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 something that that we need to uh, that we need to uh, be uh, aware of so that would be kind of my and the uh, very much grateful for, for an opportunity to discuss it. And I hope we will be able to discuss it even further and maybe come up with something more concrete. Thanks, Adi, and I'm sure that will happen. So Chloe would be, I would hand over to you for a response. Thanks, Lauren. And to start with your question on the way the three projects complement each other, I think uh, what I see in, in both uh, stage accession and, uh, and single market access is this will to make the accession progress process much more dynamic and which is what we also sought uh, when we discussed this new methodology a couple of years ago in order to make sure that there was more reversibility in, in the accession process but also that you could see uh, on a merits based more more progress more rapidly and that probably reveals that there's a still a bit of work to be done on that side to increase the incentives both uh, for the EU and, and for the Western Balkans. On the, um, on the stage accession, I see uh, many similarities or at least many complementarities with the, with the EPC. First of all, obviously, um, the sense of participation in the political deliberation early on and in decision-making forum. Uh, it was also an idea initially of the new methodology that some member states could have observers or candidates could have some observer status in, in certain discussions. Um, I see that in some of the, the stages of the stage accession. For us, EPC is also that kind of table where everyone can come together and develop a common culture and a common way of approaching certain issues, be it on, on, from sanctions to the pandemic, but at least on an equal footing, uh, being able to, to discuss these topics at leaders' level. The second uh, similarity to me is this notion of providing stronger support to countries which are striving uh, to reform their systems and to promote similar values to ours. Uh, through the stage accession, it's through uh, levels of funding progressively, 
and uh, EPC would be through projects, but again, it's um, very much linked and, and to us it wouldn't be only in the Western Balkan, we would see the value of it, for instance, in, in Ukraine in the, in the reconstruction phase. Uh, third, and uh, Milena said it very well, stepping out of this in or out approach. And for us, EPC, and this links to Florent's question of accession, uh, this should really quickly give access to all countries to these discussions. Um, even though the end objective is to reach fully fledged membership, we think that there's phases that can be uh, fulfilled before and, uh, and allow for this uh, time span to be shortened a little bit and, and to reduce the feeling of being in or out of the club during the discussion. And lastly, uh, and uh, Adi mentioned it, this very strong convergence on, on norms, standards and values, which is really at the core of the idea of the EPC uh, in the accession uh, stage accession model it goes through quantified uh, evaluations of, uh, of the criteria. Uh, it would still be, have to be defined in the EPC, but it would definitely be at the root of the community. And that was one of the two criteria which the president gave uh, in his first speech on May 9th. On the single market proposal, um, that's also something that would deserve discussions among member states. I think you'd find a very different uh, positionings on the issue. What's certain is that it's a very strong lever for reform, and that's exactly the reason why it is also in the accession process. Uh, and it's also a very good leverage for integration, and that was said very well at the economic and, and social level. Um, we haven't gone that far in the reflection, but it's definitely an issue which uh, should be discussed uh, but with the different caveats that were mentioned on how you articulate that with uh, the political forum and the political discussions. To come back to, to Florent's different questions, and um, there the devil is definitely in the details. Um, actually, those are more or less the questions which we started discussing at the EU level between member states and which we would need to discuss with the first members of the EPC. Uh, on accession, I, um, I mentioned that I think we should be able to create this uh, community very quickly, which means that we couldn't recreate uh, a, a similar accession process to that of the EU, which would take years. We would need something much more uh, supple and fast. So I think it would be quite different to the, to the EU accession process. Uh, but as you said, we would need to at least agree on what kind of criteria we use to compare democratic values and the respect thereof, and uh, also the geographic scope. And to us, uh, this really needs to be discussed amongst the, the founding members. Uh, on interests of each member of the EPC, to us, it's precisely the variety of interests of each potential member uh, that creates the richness of, of the community. We're quite realistic about the fact that um, a Northern European non-EU state would not come for the same reasons as a Western Balkan state or as the Ukraine would come. Uh, each one would have different interests, either in participating in security or foreign policy discussions, which they don't have access to, or uh, having more access to certain projects of cooperation. But to us, it's rather a strength than a than a weakness of the project, because this is what could bring everyone together uh, under the condition that we keep those two dimensions of the EPC, so the political discussion and decision-making level and the projects uh, which underlie it. Uh, and lastly, on the role of the EU, I think it's, uh, uh, Florent, what you pointed out is exactly the balance we need to reach between, on the white right side, making sure that we have all members on an equal footing and that, uh, need, that, that leads us to not having a special group for EU member states. All, all members of the EPC should have similar access and rights, so there shouldn't, shouldn't be a differentiation within the EPC. At the same time, I did mention that we want this structure to be as light and flexible as possible, and there are already many cooperation projects and uh, agreements with the EU and third countries. So we are convinced that we could um, use a lot of these existing structures to reinforce our cooperation whilst preserving, the, obviously, the 
uh, decision-making autonomy of the EU. So we'd have to articulate both of those. Thank you very much. So we have quite a number of questions. Um, some of them are for all of the panelists um, and I would and others are specifically. So I would just kind of point out a few of the questions which in the final round all of our panelists uh, can can address. Um, so there, there are questions which are to do with the question of democracy. Um, so we have a question by uh, by Andre de Munter about the role of parliaments in these processes. So the kind of democratic checks and balances, as well as a question by uh, Jakob Levander about um, the role of public opinion in particular in the member states about how to bring them on board with these different uh, proposals. Um, and then we have, um, we have uh, questions from uh, several participants regarding the procedures. Um, uh, David Hoek has a question about, uh, as, as does uh, uh, Thomas Bickel, about the, Q, you know, the qualified majority uh, versus unanimity in the enlargement process. This is less part of your proposals, but the, of course the big elephant in the room, which has been blocking it, is this something to be undone or what are the challenges uh, in particular in regard uh, to, to the, you know, the possibility to introduce uh, something like that? Um, we have then a couple of questions uh, for Milena. Um, Milena, you were asked by Dragos Ionta about, you know, will member states and candidate countries sign up to a new way of doing things after they've signed up to the new methodology? So uh, how many new ways will they be willing to tolerate, so to speak? Uh, and we have Franz Lothar Altmann who asks about uh, the grace period. Um, uh, does What does that mean um, specifically and how to call these different steps um, um, specifically about is it provisional membership, part membership, stage membership, limited me membership? Maybe you can address uh, those questions. And to Chloe, we have Jelena Pfister who asked about to which degree can the EPC contribute to questions of democracy and rule of law, um, considering that it's, uh, in your view, a very light structure, one with a quick accession process, which probably wouldn't be as of course shouldn't shouldn't be and couldn't be as stringent as the european u uh, would be and that's also something which uh which happens with the other ones to which degree i mean mila Nietzsche, for example asked to which degree does it really socialize a society because again the epc presumably would be light institutionally in all the plans so the kind of socialization of um, not just elites but also bureaucracies which we see in the eu wouldn't necessarily occur with all of that um so I would suggest that we begin our last round. Each of you has uh, about two to three minutes. Uh, sorry, uh, time is short, but I think as you all say, we will continue this conversation on another occasion. So we'll begin with Florent um, and then uh, go uh, backwards uh, uh, in, in the order of the original order of participants. Yes. Uh, I find it very interesting what Milena is advancing. So we could actually indeed combine that. I see that these, these models, and I see also the fact that the EPC has, has a room to think about this, this, this uh, what uh, um, uh, Mitterrand was calling set theories, um, to think how things are going together. Um, the proposals we have from, from SEP and EASY, they are trying to make the out less out. And that is a very good thing. Uh, uh, it's better to, but we, we could think about not only having the out less out, but how to have the out also move in. And I think this is where uh, other issue areas uh, could play at hand. Within the member states, we don't have a very strong support for EU citizenry building. We have national citizens with EU passports. Uh, we have EU institutions, but we are not growing generations of Europeans. Uh, uh, the schools are not are not are not sending pupils uh, abroad in different cultures, exposing them to 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 other member states from early age. We wait this Erasmus thing when people are already opened and their identities are already built. So these are competencies where the EU has not built yet its competence. Uh, European so citizen to education is one. So in this respect, we could find allies. I think among non-EU member states willing to make, uh, to, make, um, to make steps forward towards more federalization, uh, confederalization in this scope, which are extremely important for building European citizenry, investing in a new York, 
It's a long-term engagement. And here you don't need conditionality. Here you can, you can vibrate, you can emulate um, a, a solidarity among younger people, younger generations. So I see some kind of, of combina so possible combinations uh, and maybe the EPC could be a place where these, these, these projects, which are very, very speaking to youngsters, uh, early age could be implemented or imagined. Okay, thanks, Chloe. Yes, and thanks, Florent, because one of the ideas actually behind the APC is also to increase mobility and youth mobility. So I think uh, there would be also a lot to do on that level and on a project base. Uh, on, on bringing together and, and bringing closer Western Balkan to the EU, obviously, um, I think national parliaments uh, play a very strong role. And at all levels, we need to increase cooperation uh, between uh, obviously elected parliaments, but also civil society, as we said, uh, youth earlier on. Uh, to answer the question on, on public opinion and uh, the way to bring them on board, uh, again, we are in a context where the international situation is evolving very quickly, but my feeling is rather that European public opinion is looking for more unity and coherence uh, at the European level, European being meant at the continental level. Uh, so obviously this would require a lot of communication and explanation, but I don't feel that there's um, a strong opposition to the idea of working better together to face both security and foreign policy challenges, but also other global challenges which the BC could uh, deal with. Uh, voting rules and uh, qualified majority. Um, as uh, Milena said uh, earlier, we really need to use this uh, time span to make sure that we reform uh, the EU from the inside. And that's actually something that President Macron said uh, uh, from the beginning uh, in his uh, Sorbonne speech and, and has been uh, repeating in the last five years is that it's gonna be difficult for us to further integrate member states if we haven't improved our own functioning and our own rules. Um, he's uh, favorable to treaty change if needed and on voting rules to, to qualified voting majority, both fiscal and, and uh, foreign policy. This is a discussion which we need to conduct with member states, but I think the last few months have shown that we face quite frequently the the lack of unanimity and, and that uh, we really need to keep working on this issue to make sure that our institutions function better. And, you know, the day we have 30, 32 member states within the EU that we have the, we equipped uh, sufficiently to be able to, to have a effective decision making. Um, the last question was on uh, democracy and the rule of law in the EPC. Um, to me, the strengthening of, of uh, rule of law would uh, go th mostly through the projects, because these projects would ov obviously be linked to conditionalities and to helping these countries reform the sector in which the project happens, be it energy, transport, so it would definitely creates a strong link between progress and democracy and rule of law and uh, infrastructure and, and concrete projects without replacing the existing benchmarks and uh, improvement that is sought through the enlargement process. But again, the EPC goes beyond those countries which are candidates. So the idea is also to be able to promote uh, these norms and, and values beyond those specific countries. Thank you. Thanks, Chloe. Adi. Yes, maybe I start with qualified majority voting because I think we need to be very careful when we're discussing about that issue and be clear that it's not about getting rid of the annoying countries that use the fact that there is unanimity or something and blocking things. It's, uh, it's about engaging those countries in the process uh, that then leads to a uh, to decisions that are then 
uh, accepted actually by, by all countries, because we see that also in the areas where we have qualified majority voting today, uh, it's uh, not, I wouldn't say rarely used, but very often it is not being used. One example related to the Western Balkans is the Kosovo visa liberalization process. You know, it's a qualify, qualified majority voting uh, issue, but we're still uh, waiting uh, on it. So the fact that uh, one day we might get a reform in which unanimity will be completely abolished, and we will have qualified majority voting, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the EU will then be deciding you know, in a speed of light, it means just that countries will be engaged in the process because they will have the interest to have their stake uh, heard uh, up until uh, the end. When it comes to the topic of, of today, I think it's important for us to uh, look at what is realistic in 2022 and what is realistic to agree on and what is realistic uh, to achieve by 2026. I think that EU membership for Montenegro by 2026 is realistic option because countries can, uh, if they receive support, if they receive feedback, if, and if EU member states are interested, can finalize the process of accession process uh, within uh, several years, three to five years. And Montenegro has already been uh, negotiating uh, for uh, 10 years. I think it's also realistic that EU member states agree on offering uh, all other Western Balkan countries an interim step. If you look at the new uh, or adapted uh, negotiating framework for Montenegro and Serbia, you will find that member states already agreed uh, for the commission to look into ways of integrating those two, two countries into the single market. If you look at the Berdo declaration, uh, not just 27, but also six Western Balkan countries accepted uh, uh, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, path. And if you look at what the council conclusions from two weeks ago are pointing also in, in, in that uh, direction. And I think if uh, we look towards 2026 as a, as a year where potentially all of them, if they work, if they reform, if they implement things that are expected from them, uh, can become uh, members of the single market and enjoy in full, in full freedoms, then if we in parallel have these discussions on EU internal uh, reforms and have these countries transform themselves into a full-fledged parts of, of a single market, then, then discussion on getting them into the full membership like Montenegro or like Croatia or any other country that is full member, the EU becomes more realistic and becomes more uh, tangible than it is uh, today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adi. Milena. Thanks, Florian. In the interest of time, I will just focus on the questions that uh, were asked. Uh, on the question of whether this is another change of methodology, I would not call this another change of methodology. This is the operationalization of the of the new methodology uh, that was adopted in 2020, but also a proposal that takes it one step forward because uh, the new methodology on accession uh, process doesn't say what happens when a country actually uh, um, becomes ready uh, to, to, to join the EU. So what happens when it closes uh, all the chapters? Will the EU, as Chloe also uh, referred to it, will the EU be institutionally ready uh, to accept new members? So basically what we are proposing is to uh, offer some interim, uh, interim uh, um, rewards in the process to accession. We're not proposing to change anything in the, in the process in terms of how accession negotiations are, uh, are led. We are, pro we, 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 let's say, we referred to some proposals in the sense that it would be good for the EU to uh, use less of unanimity voting and to move to qualified majority voting wherever possible in relation to the current treaty framework. This is not maybe the core part of our proposal, but it is highly complementary with our proposal. And we think that it would be good for the EU uh, to, to use qualified majority voting in the enlargement policy wherever possible based on current treaty framework. Um, but at the same time, the, our proposal is political in the sense that it offers this kind of a, you know, grand bargain between uh, the candidate countries and the EU. We get in the pre-accession period some benefits which no other candidate country got in the pre-accession uh, period before. Increased institutional participation. This also refers to Andre de Munter's question about the role of parliaments. So for example, we already proposed that in the pre-accession stages, 
uh, parliaments of the candidate countries uh, send the, uh, delegates uh, uh, to uh, to participate as observers in the in the meetings of the of the European Parliament. That there is institutional socialization also between the parliaments, not only uh, between the executives. Uh, and then in return for getting those uh, uh, pre-accession rewards, which were never granted before, we offer uh, something in return, and that is this grace period to the EU to reform. And then getting to the other two uh, questions, this grace period, once it is stipulated in the accession treaty of, a, of an acceding country, it cannot be changed. Otherwise, the accession treaty would have to be changed. Or basically, if you stipulate it as a transitional period, at the end of this transitional period, unless there is a special provision to somehow prolong it, it simply expires. Once it expires, uh, the, the new member state, as we call it, so this member state with these small exceptions, uh, and I, I have to say that in already uh, at, at this third stage of new new uh, new member state, the the the, the exceeding the, the the new member state uh, citizens become EU citizens. They can stand for EU, EU elections. They can be elected. They participate in all uh, the you know in, in in all the let's say benefits, and they also can can get protection from the ECJ. So everything is uh, let's say the same as for citizens of any other EU member state. The only exceptions are uh, these derogated uh, voting rights and mo monitoring um, of, um, of uh, rule of law and democratic reforms. So this period, th this, uh, these uh, temporary pr provisions just elapse and uh, the new member state becomes a conventional normal EU member state uh, as any other. Um, the name of stage three, we named it new member state. It was just logical because all the new member, all the member states uh, which joined after 2004 were for years called new member states without that meaning anything so, so much formally. So we just we decided to call it a new member state because in reality, those countries are new member states and this somehow, let's say, also justifies maybe a little bit uh, this kind of a period which is a sort of a transition and adjustment uh, into the into the decision making of the EU. Thank you. Thank you, Milena. Uh, thank you, Adi. Thank you, Florent. Thank you, Chloe, for, for your uh, thoughts, your reflections. Unfortunately, we've come to the end of today's debate. I believe there is great merit in discussing these proposals separately and together in dialogue. Uh, and I think that hopefully this is an initiative to continue uh, in whatever format, hopefully in person with greater time to explore exactly how one could make them work together. Um, I would like to also thank um, Christian Hagemann and the Südost Europa Gesellschaft, as well as uh, Milena Stefanovic and the European Fund for the Balkans for making this event possible, uh, for all of the audience for asking great questions. Uh, I wish all of you a good uh, summer, uh, hopefully, and uh, inspirational ideas, and we will continue our discussion, hopefully, in the near future. All the best.